uh, Chief of Navy, uh, Vice Admiral Ray Griggs, uh, service chiefs, former service chiefs, distinguished guests, senior naval and military officers from all over the globe, ladies and gentlemen, it is a considerable privilege for me as the Australian Chief of Army to have been invited back uh, for my second appearance at the Sea Power Conference uh, following uh, my chance in 2011 at the uh, invitation of Chief of Navy. I think it is, as Ray said, an affirmation of the way uh, the leadership team in the ADF views Australia's strategic focus and the needs that the ADF fill uh, in terms of our strategic future. And I do want to take the opportunity before I go any further on congratulating the Chief of Navy and all of the members of the RAN on attaining that marvellous milestone that we have celebrated over this last weekend, uh, the Navy in the service of our nation. And I want to take this opportunity, of course, too, of acknowledging uh, the men and women of the RAN who have given their lives in the service of their nation. And I, I know that uh, the celebrations and the ceremony of this last weekend have also marked their sacrifice as well. I think that the relationship between the Army, the Navy and the Air Force, good-natured rivalry notwithstanding, has probably never been deeper or more enduring. It has been formed in the crucible of war, where we have had shared perils and uh, losses. And so, Ray, on behalf of the Army, I would like to salute you and the Navy team for what has been an outstanding ceremony and celebration. Now, for reasons which I intend to address, I believe that we are a nation who sometimes falls prey to the collective amnesia about the extraordinary service of the Royal Australian Navy. Over a century ago, the great sea power theorist, Alfred Thayer Mahan, wrote eloquently of the silent, inexorable and invisible operation of the blockade which crushed the innards of Napoleon's empire. The achievements of our soldiers, enhanced, indeed perhaps even distorted by the Anzac mythology, has in my view created a foundation narrative which has led our nation to accepting the fruits of our maritime security as a free public good. It is as invisible in some respects as Mahan's blockade. Our trade flows freely, our petrol stations are replenished, our supermarket shelves are full to meet our whims and our commerce flourishes. Yet Australians collectively do not reflect on the enormous national investment involved in sustaining the maritime conditions for that happy state of affairs, and nor do they consider overly that much of it is also underwritten by the United States as the leading global power of our era. While many of Mahan's insights are today of primarily historical value, his assertion that the oceans of the world constitute ubiquitous highways is so profoundly obvious as to conceal its genius. In much the same way that Clausewitz's observation that war is the violent prosecution of policy now sounds self-evidently banal, having become conventional wisdom that Australia is an island, albeit one of immense mass, is equally as obvious. So our survival, even in peacetime, depends upon the sea. And yet, despite universal lip service to the innately maritime character of our geography, the Western civilization that has grown here since European settlement has not, in my view, developed a deep intrinsic link to that character. As another maritime theorist, my friend Ray Griggs, told the Australian Strategic Policy Institute in 2011, a more appropriate wording in the first stanza of our national anthem may have been girt by beach rather than girt by sea. He was pointing to the underdeveloped consciousness which should properly underscore mature, sea, true sea-mindedness in Australia. His point is well made and it concerns me every much as bit as it bothers him. Our strategic culture and the strategic policy which incubates it are the poorer, 
for that cognitive failure which is derived from a deeply entrenched continental mindset. Now, last week I conducted my military uh, history conference in Canberra, the theme of which was armies in a maritime strategy. There, amongst many excellent presentations, I heard an insightful presentation from Professor Michael Evans, who I believe to be one of the most innovative and influential strategic thinkers currently working in Australia. He expounded on the lack of sea-mindedness to which Ray Griggs had alluded in his eloquent quip from 2011. He described Australia as a maritime nation with a continental culture. His hypothesis was carefully arrived at delving into the national psyche and soul. He analysed the narrative of the Australian settlement and the degree to which we define ourselves as a sunburnt country. Scrutiny of the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are show a people pitted against a harsh, implacable and ultimately forbidding continental environment. And so while we revere the sacrifice of our soldiers at Gallipoli, how many people really understand the naval and amphibious campaigns which lodged us on what Chris Masters had termed the fatal shore? The digger legend is powerful, but it skews the way Australians view security, especially the wider contribution of this nation to the global order of the last century and our obligations to maintaining that benign order in this one. Yet, this absence of pervasive oceanic consciousness disguises the fact that European settlement of this great southern land was achieved by the leading maritime power of that era. Likewise, it ignores the reality that our security was initially founded in no small part on Great Britain and later on its liberal democratic successor, the United States. In plain language, our prosperity and role in the world is reliant on the freedom of navigation and the unimpeded use of Mahan's great highways, which is guaranteed by the dominant maritime power of the day at a most significant discount of expenditure of our own national treasure. The naval and, mis and, and military professionals in the room grasp this reality, but I think too few of our fellow citizens do as well. More worryingly, I fear that the same may be true of some of those who would seek to advise our policymakers. However, this is not a council of despair. Australians are nothing if not pragmatic. Regardless of this myopia, our strategic practice has been intuitively shrewd. We have collaborated with the dominant liberal democratic maritime power de jour since Federation and have benefited immensely from that choice. Again, as I reflected on Mike Evans's call to raise public consciousness about our maritime future in this rapidly growing, dynamically changing Indo-Pacific region, I recalled former Prime Minister John Howard's pithy yet insightful warning that Australia need not choose between its history and its geography. Read in conjunction with Paul Keating's similarly profound insight that Australia must seek its security in Asia rather than from Asia, we can discern the rapid progress Australia has made from the aberrant years when we sought to secure Australia behind the moat of the so-called air-sea gap. Now there is a warning in this, that because of our lack of oceanic mindset, we risk forfeiting all those other natural elements of maritime power which we are so lavishly endowed. However, as a soldier and a capability manager, I am optimistic about our current strategic focus, and here is why. We have come a very long way since the strategic shock of 1999 in East Timor, which roused us from a torpor of the mindset of the defence of Australia narrowly construed as continental defence. In that regard, I would demur from John Howard in a minor, though not purely, semantic way. As he sagely argued, we need not make a false binary uh, choice between our European origins and our Asian geography to achieve Paul Keating's 
uh, vision of security in Asia, but we must choose our true history. We need to recognise that despite the prodigious feats of arms of our soldiers and the romance of the bush, our troops have never fought a battle on our continent. May it remain so. But as long as the gap between myth and reality in our national identity and ancillary strategic culture remains so great, we will struggle, in my view, to achieve our potential as a second tier maritime power. And for that classification, I am indebted to that fine strategic scholar, Patrice Hauser, who would situ situate Australia amongst relatively sophisticated medium powers for whom local sea control, albeit for particular periods of time, is both possible and indeed a strongly desirable capability objective. It recognises that area sea control is unachievable for us and that that remains a monopoly of the great naval powers. Of necessity, we can only collaborate with compatible major powers and contribute to good order at sea and achieve limited force projection in coalition with our allies. Now, we are well on the way to achieving that level of maritime capability in Australia with political support across the spectrum. That vision of a seamlessly joint ADF structured to implement a maritime strategy in defence of Australia through the denial of the use of our land, sea and air approaches to our nation is fundamentally correct. It is supported by the ADF senior leadership and it is underpinned by a defence capability plan which will put flesh on the bones of that vision. Now, of course, it will require a shift in national resources to fund and sustain it. And in the aftermath of our longest war, fought primarily in a landlocked country, we must take uh, the intellectual lead in explaining this to the Australian public. After all, they must fund it and they provide their sons and daughters to serve in this joint force in an era when individual opportunity and self-actualisation have reduced the appeal of service careers. That is why our deficit in oceanic consciousness has the potential to undermine our centre of gravity in pursuit of professional mastery of joint maritime warfare. Perhaps the thousands of proud Australians who cheered the arrival of the first flotilla a hundred years ago understood better than we do the nexus between an actively engaged citizenship and maritime power. As senior advisers to the government, we must take a moral and professional lead in this. However, we must be truly joint in our advocacy. As I have stated somewhat ad nauseum since I became uh, I've started to fill my current appointment. Australia needs its ADF more than it needs its Army, its Navy and its Air Force. And a joint maritime strategy is only as strong as its weakest service. None of us can afford the dubious luxury of short-term single service wins at the expense of the coherence of our maritime capability. Again, I've never been more optimistic as to our future, notwithstanding the climate of austerity which is setting the tenor of this strategic debate. In my remaining time today, I want to explain how Army's modernisation axis of advance is inherently joint and postures us to take uh, our role, or play our role, in a maritime strategy as described under extant strategic guidance. In general, Armies modernise by drawing lessons from their operations and calibrating their experience against history and the changing character of war as determined by technological change and politico-cultural trends. After a decade at war and even longer on sustained operations across a diverse range of threat environments and against a range of foes, I think we've moved quickly to enhance our firepower to digitise our sensor shooter links and to better align our command and control systems to our higher joint operational headquarters. Internally, we have also better aligned our force generation cycles to that strategic guidance. We are in the midst of the most comprehensive re-equipment and modernisation program since the end of the Second World War. The end state 
will be an army that can generate combined arms effects in a joint coalition setting while surviving against either a peer competitor or a potent irregular enemy. We are reorganising to field three standard multi-role medium weight combat brigades. We are shifting from a light infantry army to a light mechanised army deployable by sea rather than just air and capable of implementing the guidance of the government which decrees that we are able to deploy a battalion group for a contingency within our primary operating environment while simultaneously sustaining a brigade group on operations in the immediate neighbourhood. Plan Bathsheba rounds out the improvements begun in the wake of the 1999 East Timor crisis which spawned that guidance and the derivative roles and tasks for the Army and the ADF. Significantly, the introduction of the landing helicopter docks will be a transformative development, developing an Army component capable of wet soldiering. The devil, of course, will be in the detail, the range of specialist skills, trades and employment codes to conduct even permissive entry operations is formidable. Delivering land effects from, the sea, plat from, three, from sea platforms is the most demanding military task that can be asked of a joint force. Few nations on earth can achieve it. We will soon be joining that elite club, but the price of admission is high and we need to bring our society with us if we are to achieve it. It requires a national commitment, not an ADF plan. There is much to be done, but as we reflect on the challenges that our remote nation overcame to fund, design and build that majest majestic fleet which steamed into this great harbour a hundred years ago, we must surely conclude that we are capable of meeting any future challenge if we can muster even a portion of their resolve and patriotism. It's been a great pleasure to be able to join you today. I thank again uh, Ray Griggs for the invitation and again I congratulate him and the RAN team on where they stand today in 2013 and how they are postured as part of our joint strategic future. Thank you. <laughs>